Welcome back to Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodericks. Joining me today is Dr. Stephen Lieb. He's a world-renowned economist, finance expert, and money manager. Dr. Lieb is the founder of Lieb Capital Management and The Complete Investor, which is published by The Daily Investor. Stephen is also a best-selling author, and his new book titled China's Rise and the New Age of Gold, How Investors Can Profit from a Changing World, is set to be released November 3rd. How are you today, Dr. Lieb? I'm doing well, Tom. Very well. Thanks. Thanks for having me, incidentally. Thank you very much. Great to have you. And I wanted to get some of your opinions about the new book, and we can have some discussion around that and about, like you say, China's rise and how we can all profit from the coming rise in gold. So why don't you start by explaining to us that you haven't always been a gold bug. That was something I found very interesting. And it kind of really shows that the objective nature that you bring to this side of investing. Well, no, in fact, I've for much of my life, maybe because I've lived so long, I can say that I was not at all a gold bug. I mean, the first book I published was in 1986, Putnam. So, you know, I'm not making it up was basically, uh, I think the title was Getting In on the Ground Floor, How You Can Profit Now and From Now On in the New Bull Market. Conditions were, at that time, exactly or very similar to where they were at the beginning of the 1920s and at the beginning of the 1950s when we started a major bull market. And admittedly, the market went a lot further than I expected at that time, but it was my interest you know in this business started with my interest in the stock market the u.s stock market and it remained there i would say until probably the beginning of this century and then i started shifting because i mean there was basically compelling evidence that the world had changed and it had changed a lot and the more i investigated the more research i did i realized that this was a real change this was a real turning point and what was successful up through 2000 was probably not going to be successful thereon. And I really did shift. And that shift is growing more and more dramatic as time has passed. Absolutely, Dr. Lieben. And you have two main reasons for gold's rise. So why don't we start with the first one? Well, the first one is basically the coming of age of the developing world. We began this century with high income countries, OECD countries, if you will, which represented maybe 15% of the world's population. Over the preceding 40 years, that 15% of the world's population had grown much, much faster than any other part of the world. In fact, the annualized rate of growth for the high income countries over, let's say, that 40 year period was probably close to twice the rate of growth of the world as a whole. And if you look at them relative to the not so well off countries, there was a major gap. I mean, the rich were getting richer and the poor were, you know, maybe moving up a little, but not very much. And the very poor, I mean, the people that were really living at poverty levels, they were getting ever poor. I mean, poverty was increasing between 1960 and 2000. And the GDP of the poor countries during that period was actually going down. That changed. That changed very dramatically for one reason, China. China became very active. They became a part of the World Trade Organization and they really took off. Now, when countries that are developing and basically the high income countries, when I say high income, the OECD, they were the only developed countries and they still basically are the only developed countries in the world. And the gap between them in terms of, let's say, income per capita, GDP per capita, and the rest of the world was something like 25 to 1 at the beginning of the century. There were high income, and then there was this massive gap to the next, you know, upper middle class was hardly upper middle class. And the gap between high income and poor may have been 100 or 200 to 1. I mean, it was just incredible. Now, Since China became very active, obviously, there's a lot more room to grow if you don't have much going for you. I mean, small can grow much faster than big. And China really took off and they took a lot of the developing world with them. I mean, 
because they had all the people. I mean, there's 85 percent of the world that's developing and 15 percent of the people that were not. And this meant in the developed world, if we go back to the beginning of the 20th century, you'll see that, you know, we did not use many commodities. I mean, commodities were not essential to our way of life. Oil was very important. That's true. And, you know, commodities were important, but basically we were a service economy. And that is not where, you know, you're going to see a lot of commodity use. I mean, services are not commodity intensive. But China, the rest of the developing world, 85% of the population were very commodity intensive. If they were going to grow, they were going to need a tremendous amount of commodities. Now, here we are 20 years later, And you still have a gap between those high income countries and the rest of the world. But that gap is now nine to one. For the first time, I think in recorded history, the developing world is now larger than the developed world. Not only are they larger, but they're growing much faster. That also changed. Prior to 2000, it was the developed world that was growing much faster, much faster than the developing world, just 15% of the population. But in the 20 years since then, it's the developing world, the Chinas of the world, the Koreas of the world, the Taiwans of the world, growing much, much faster than the high income part of the world. And, you know, it's it's interesting in 2008, 2009, I mean, we don't like going back there, but it was really the Chinese that bailed us out as much as anything else. I mean, they kept their economy really growing very, very rapidly, and that did definitely help the world. But when you look at this, you have to believe that financial assets, which really define how well you're doing in the developed world are not necessarily going to be the same as they were in the previous 40 years when, you know, the developed world was growing so fast. When the developing world is growing fast, it's going to be commodities that do extremely well. And where we're at right now, at the end of the first generation of this century, there's still tremendous room for more use of commodities, much, much more. Anything, it might be accelerating as we, you know, go into the next generation. One reason would be that we have to convert probably to renewable energies, but even excluding that, just to see this nine to one gap, let's say narrow to four to one, which is still, you know, tremendous. You're going to need a lot of commodities for the developing world to catch up. Maybe China, not so much, but India and all the rest of the developing world. I mean, it's that. And when you look at what went on is that we didn't catch it. We had a blind spot and it has hurt us in a lot of ways. It's hurt us in that We did not advise people to get into commodities. You had to be sort of like an outlier to think that commodities were going to do well, and especially gold. You know, for various reasons, when commodities do well, gold, it's ironic. Gold, even though it has no industrial use, that cannot be easily substituted. I mean, it can be used in certain areas as a catalyst, like the motor like, like the automobile industry, the chemical, some chemicals may use gold as a catalyst, but we can replace that with silver, with copper, et cetera. No problem. Gold is the one commodity that has value that is not related to industrial uses. Now, ironically, you would think, who cares about gold? Well, the point is gold, for whatever reasons, and I'm not going to try and explain this, because I don't have an answer. It's not because I, it's, the explanation is, is long. I'm sure it's long, but I don't know it. But for whatever reasons, gold is valued because of its beauty. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, a very quick anecdote shows you maybe I, I mean, I know a lot more about gold now than I did then when I was writing something else. I wanted to say something about gold. And I didn't know anything to really say other than a bunch of cliches. And then I was working in a country And we used to get our mail delivered there. And one of the magazines I subscribed to was Nature. And I literally had no clue as to why gold was special. Went to my mailbox, still remember this, and got out my copy of Nature. And on the cover was a gold bar. 
And they had a lot of technical arguments on what made gold so special. And it was the first time that I realized that, you know, it, it's malleable. I mean, you can stretch it, you can do this and that, but it's also intrinsically beautiful. It never oxidizes. It's almost impossible to oxidize gold. There's something beautiful about gold. And for that reason, it is prized. It has been prized for the last what, 5,000 years as something that is beautiful in and of itself. I mean, I think that, you know, Plato considered it maybe one of the platonic beauties. I mean, you know, something that really defined beauty. I mean, he rejected that, but it's always been regarded as beautiful, meaning that it had value in and of itself. And that made it an incredibly special commodity. It was a commodity that people always wanted, even though it did not have industrial uses. And that's why I think it does so well when commodities in general are doing very well, because it's the one commodity that if used as a currency and gold is used as a currency, in fact, you know, banks define it as a currency, they can keep it on their balance sheet as a currency. And, you know, in some parts of the world, in China, for instance, it's considered, I think, as good as cash as a currency. And the reason this commodity is valued in that way is it's special. It's special in ways that other commodities are not. And, and the, as a consequence, when you see commodities rising, the first thing that has to occur to you, at least it occurs to me, that are we facing scarcities, fundamental scarcities in these commodities? And if we are facing fundamental scarcities, how are we going to allocate these scarcities among, let's say, different countries? You know, you're not going to allocate, it's not fair to allocate them by who can print the most money. Let's say that copper is scarce. Are you going to allocate the amount of copper that a country gets by how much money they can print? No, it just doesn't make sense to do that. And I think that that's why gold became, is such a special commodity and tends to outperform every other commodity when there are commodity scarcities. And there were commodity scarcities for much of the first generation. And in fact, even now, commodity scarcities are sort of showing up. I mean, copper has been a great performer recently. I mean, in a pandemic, give me a break. Why? Well, because there's shortage of copper supply and all of a sudden the developing world is, you know, developing again. They handled the COVID crisis a lot better than we did. I mean, the entire developing world, Asia and the entire West did a, you know, did not do a good job, whether it's the U.S., Canada, maybe the U.S. is a little bit worse, but they're not as bad as Belgium or Spain. I mean, it's it, the entire West just struck out when it came to this, whereas the entire East whether it be Taiwan, which hasn't had a case in 200 days, or China itself, which basically, I mean, thanks to their government, was able to, you know, lock down. I mean, you may not approve of that, but for whatever reasons, South Korea, very, very few cases, et cetera, they basically have, you know, kept their economies going. I mean, they're recovering and things like commodities, again, are becoming scarce very, very quickly. And I think that this kind of trend, even once we're past COVID, is going to continue in spades. There's no sign that it should slow up. I mean, the keys to, you know, it's slowing up is that these other countries become basically oriented around services. And I don't see that happening for at least another 20 years. And what's so upsetting about this is that here you have a commodity called gold, which is basically accessible. I mean, you can buy gold, you can buy stocks underlying gold, no financial advisor will recommend gold. And this is, it's not owned in this country. And it's basically just, the emperor has no clothes. I mean, I, I can't explain it. You have an asset, something considered a currency, namely gold, that has outperformed, and I underline this, outperformed the S&P 500 by 200 percentage points. And when I say the S&P 500, I'm saying S&P 500 dividends reinvested. I'm not finagling these numbers at all. And I was stunned by that. By 200 percentage points greater 
you would have, if you had just bought gold or even gold stocks like GLD, like anything that represented the physical metal, you would have outperformed the S&P by again, 200 percentage points. Think of how much better off everybody would be if they had had financial advisors at the beginning of this century telling them, look, it's going to possibly be a new world. We're not sure, but we have China. They're really aggressive. They've been growing fast. If they continue to grow fast, commodities are going to be in short supply and gold is going to rise. And there's really no excuse for them not saying that because they had the 1970s as, as an example. But there, the commodity shortages in oil were caused by a particular geopolitical event, namely a boycott of oil. But it still created scarcities and we didn't know how long it was going to last. And we knew gold took off at 30% a year at an annualized rate. Well, here we're looking at not a geopolitical event that could be corrected, but we were looking at possibly a fundamental economic event that was likely to lead to scarcities. It wasn't hard to see. And as you went further into the century, it became apparent, <laughs> yet no one, no one was recommending gold. When I say no one, I mean no one in the so-called financial industry. And recently, well, let me just say this, something that I realized, and I, I'm sorry I didn't look this up before because it's not in my book. It wasn't just gold that outperformed. It was copper, it was silver, it was iron ore, and I think that's it. Those three, those three very important metals, especially iron ore and copper. Iron ore is a real surprise. I mean, because there's a lot of it, but you need a lot of energy to produce it and turn it into steel. Iron ore outperformed the S&P 500. Copper outperformed the S&P 500. And silver outperformed the S&P 500. So it wasn't just gold. It wasn't just, you know, some sort of geopolitical thing. It was basically these commodities became scarcer. The number, the amount of reserves of copper that we have today is quite a bit less than we had at the beginning of the century. And that means even with copper at a much, much higher price, we cannot get out as much copper as we could have when copper was at a much lower price at the beginning of the century. That's serious. That is very serious. And it suggests that if we're going to gravitate toward renewable energies, if we're going to build out electric vehicles, et cetera, we are going to need massive amounts of copper, not only for that transition, but just in terms of normal development, the development that we saw in the first 20 years of this century, that's going to continue and it's going to be accentuated by the need to develop alternative energies. And we are going to need copper. It begins and ends, basically. Copper is a very, very important factor. And so is iron ore. And so is silver. If you do any of the math on silver, you have to come up with heroic assumptions as to how we're going to have enough silver in order to produce photovoltaics, the solar energies that we're going to need. And silver is also, incidentally, a monetary metal, but I don't want to get you know, stuck on that. But just in terms of its industrial value, silver is the best thermal, the best electrical conductor of anything. You cannot find another item that better conducts thermal and electricity, heat and electricity than silver. We're going to need that. And it's not at all clear to me that we're going to have anywhere enough silver in order to supply all these photovoltaic needs. Now, we've done a good job technologically in reducing the amount of silver, but we're kind of at the end. I mean, at a certain point, you can't reduce it any further. And Unless we come up with something, we're going to have a lot of trouble with silver. We're going to have a lot of trouble with other commodities like copper. And even more, because of our blindness to this, and I can't call it anything other than blindness. I mean, I, I want to make clear, I'm not a Chinophile. And as you asked me, my first question you asked was, have I always been a gold devotee? No, I've spent most of my investment life hating gold. I mean, I was called by one prominent journalist in the 1980s and 90s, a perpetual bull, like a stop clock. I was almost always bullish. And, you know, that really did change when, you know, it became apparent. Where are we going to get this stuff? And it's even more apparent today. But 
what I was saying at the beginning and where we really dropped the ball and it's crazy to me and we're still dropping it. We still haven't learned is that there are a lot of very small metals, metals that are not, you know, as visible as copper, metals that people don't know a lot about. And, you know, as an example, rare earths was one that I emphasized in my previous book, Red Alert, which was basically saying, hey, guys, watch out, something's happening. And if we're not careful, we're going to lose the ball game to China big time. And one example that I gave in that book was rare earths. We have no rare earth industry in this country. And we've tried to start it up several times. I mean, we actually, I think it was maybe in the 90s. Yes, it was under, you know, this is a pox not on any political party, incidentally. I mean, whether you're looking at Clinton, who sold our rare earth industry to China, basically, for about $10 million in the 1990s. Are you looking at Bush? Are you looking at Obama? Are you looking at Trump? All of them had chances, I mean, to not make these kinds of mistakes. But where we stand now is if you look at critical metals, things like rare earths, things like gallium, even the process. I mean, this, this again, I found this out after the book was published or after it was in print. We are not able in the U.S. to make pure silicon. In other words, we're, we're the only two countries that really can make pure silicon right now are Japan and China. We have no access to gallium in this country, zero. We really are dependent on this one French outfit for gallium. And who, who are they dependent on? China. We are, you know, all these trade wars and everything else that you see and read about China, basically, if they want to, they could stop shipping us rare earths and rare earths. How important are they? Well, I can quote and I do quote in my book, military U.S. military generals who, you know, are assigned, you know, the job of realizing or, or defining how vulnerable we may be. One quote that I had from a you know, I think a two or three star Air Force general or, you know, maybe I'm pretty sure it was Air Force. Can't remember his name. He said, without rare earths, our military is literally goes back to 1979. Rare earths are critical because they are the basis of the most powerful permanent magnets we can make. Now, you don't have to be a scientist to realize permanent magnets are a free source of electricity. It's a free source of energy. And if you have a, the most powerful permanent magnet, it's gonna give you a tremendous edge. And it gives you a tremendous edge in the military. It gives you a tremendous edge in electric vehicles, etc. And we have none of this. It's like we took all this stuff for granted. Gallium, I mean, there's a list of 13 and I, I'm unfortunately, I didn't take very much chemistry, so I can't give you that whole list. I don't know them, nor can I tell you what each and every one of these metals do, but I can tell you what we can't do as a result of not having them. We cannot, again, make pure enough silicon from which to make semiconductors. We cannot make the most sophisticated machinery. We cannot make the technology that we're using today to talk to each other without these critical metals. We are dependent on others. And among those others, and probably most prominent among those others, is China. And they basically have a long-term perspective on things, and we, which we used to have, but we lost it. And I think you want me to get to my second reason. I think I've spent a lot of time on the first reason. That's not a problem, Dr. Lee. Just to kind of summarize that first point is basically there's a major commodity scarcity coming, right? It's already here in a sense. If you look at copper, Tom, it's not coming. In a sense, it's here from our perspective right now. Yeah, there's basically no stockpile left. In one way, there's a shortage that's here. There's a large demand that we can see coming as well. And there's also the EROI, something that you and I spoke about before the call, the energy return on investment, something that applies to not only copper, not only oil, but gold as well, is basically the amount of energy that we have to expend to extract those resources is going up simply because most of the grades are going down. 
That is exactly right. And it's costing more and more commodities. It's taking greater and greater commodities to produce commodities. It's like we're in this kind of vicious circle. You put it very, very well. And that's something that's really troubling. And what's really troubling, though, I mean, I have to give you two examples of how blind we are to this. I wrote this book, Red Alert, okay? I mean, I think it's still available on Amazon. It didn't sell particularly well. I mean, I've had other books that sold a lot better, but it outlined this and it caught a lot of attention. And I even spoke to the think tank that advises Congress about rare earths and how critical these were. And I think I was interviewed by Steve Bannon. I mean, because of the rare earth issue. If I remember correctly, I was. My son reminded me actually, but yes. I mean, and that's all I talked about. And, it, you know, I'm not somebody that, you know, should, you know, people should necessarily listen to, but people like Bannon, people like, you know, in, in this think tank, but they did. In a way, they started writing articles on this. What did Congress do about it? What did, nothing. Zero. We are in the same position as we were a decade ago as far as rare earths. The same position as we were 20 years ago as far as rare earths. We are dependent on the kindness of others in order to advance our technologies. We cannot make, again, pure silicon. We have basically no, almost no critical parts of the technology chains. A couple, maybe, you know, in terms of computer design or chip design. But even there, I think China and Huawei have probably, they're probably on the same power as we are. And, you know, it's, it's very sad. It's extremely sad. We were talking before. I mean, you know, I remember when I was a super fan of Intel, I even won a contest you know, recommending Intel. They were the greatest company in the world. I, I, one of my great memories in this business when I was very young, I believe it or not, one day there was a time when I was pretty young and got excited about things like this. I got to meet Gordon Moore. I mean, he was one of the icons of the whole transistor industry. I mean, he worked with Shockley. He worked with the people that invented it. He started Intel along with Noyce, et cetera. And Intel was such a giant at that time to find 20 or 30, 30, maybe 30 years later, that Intel has been surpassed by a company that was then not even a twinkle in anyone's eye. Why? Because that company was born in Taiwan. It, it, at that time, when Intel had all this technology, Taiwan was um, maybe a member of those poor countries, but certainly had no income, nothing going for them, but, you know, just sort of a, a lot of grit. And now, 30 years later, they totally dominate in the same industry that Intel was so long, the number one company, manufacturing chips. And they're maybe four years behind Taiwan's semiconductor. This is so crazy. We had to ban or think of ways in which we could ban Taiwan semiconductor from selling chips to Taiwan. I mean, Taiwan would give them the design. I mean, not Taiwan, Huawei. Huawei would give Taiwan semiconductor the designs and Taiwan semiconductor would produce the best chips around. We would have to ban a company from Taiwan, which was a third world country only 20 or 30 years ago in order to try and protect our own technologies. How did this happen? How in the world did we go so bad in this country? I mean, we have basically no stake in vital supply chains. Um, almost no stake. When I say none, I mean, you might point to a company like Zildex, et cetera, but I mean, I really think China and Japan and Asian countries, they're the ones that, you know, the supply chain X the U.S., I don't think they would miss a beat. And I don't even think China is missing a beat, despite all these restrictions we put on them. If they were, and the time to get worried, incidentally, if China decided to ban rare earths from the U.S., China is still happily sending us their rare earths. They don't have to do that. They're sending gallium to France so, so France can refine it and send it to the U.S. 
I mean, gallium, for instance, is going to be the base basis of the next generation of semiconductor materials. We have no stake in that. How is that possible that we've gone from the greatest country on the face of the earth to where we are today, where we're really dependent and, and you know, I don't mean to overuse Tennessee Williams, but we're really dependent on the kindness of others. And it happens that it's more appropriate to say the kindness of people we perceive as enemies. How did we get into that position? China, we, we, you know, there's, that's the only thing that these, that the Democrats and Republicans can agree on right now is China. Everybody hates them. Everybody's saying bad things about China. Yet without China and without their supplies of these critical materials, we would have to step back maybe 20 years. I mean, China is letting us keep up in military. I mean, I'm not making this up. I wish I were, but I am not making this up because I'm old enough to, you know, remember this country in the early or fairly early, well, certainly the early 60s and to some extent, even the very late 50s. I mean, you know, I was kind of aware. And, you know, one of the lessons my father told me, you know, I still remember this. And my grandfather saying that, you know, this is a country that is built on savings. It's built on looking ahead. It's been built on, you know, doing things for the future. And it was true. We founded the internet. The internet was developed. Take a guess what year. I don't think anyone would, I wouldn't know this. So, I mean, don't feel bad if you don't know when the internet came around because I had no idea. The internet was developed in 1964, courtesy of Bell Labs. The transistor, I think, was invented at the end of the Second World War at Bell Labs. Bell Labs, and, you know, we, we, we sort of criticize China and some of it I understand is very, very justified because they have these state companies that they subsidize. Well, we had a kind of state company in this country through at least, I think, the 70s. And then we started breaking it up. It was called AT&T. They were responsible for all our communications. Now, they weren't owned by the state, admittedly, but they were basically a utility whose rates were set by the government. And as a utility and having all this money, they were able to fund all these long-term projects like the transistor. And once the transistor was developed, what did our government do? Something very, very intelligent. They ordered incredible amounts of transistors and that allowed miniaturization to really take off. And so Moore's law came into practice and Moore's law said that every couple of years, the number of transistors on a chip will double. And they, he was right. And through at least 2000, not only did they, they're still doubling, but now we don't get the same effects because you know you have heat and things, that's why you're having a, another generation of materials, one reason. But he was right. And one of the reasons that occurred is because we had the insight when the transistor came into being to place, the government placed tremendous orders for these transistors. And that forced them to go up this incredibly steep learning curve and learn how to miniaturize. We were, you know, our government was responsible for this. And so I guess this is the second point that I'll get to. How did this so go so wrong? How is it that we're so dependent on enemies today? And how is it that we're getting such terrible financial advice from our financial industry? Where did we go so wrong? I mean, you know, I, when I think of, you know, the first Romney, Romney's dad, you know, when he was the head of American Motors, he and a bunch of other executives, I think, used to meet, you know, once a year, you know, to see what was right about America. You know, what could we do? I mean, everybody was on on the same side. I mean, the boss of a company in those days might drive a El Dorado. I don't know if people still remember Eldorados. I don't even know if GM still makes them. Well, the employee would drive a Chevrolet, very similar. Now, we were talking before, the boss drives one Bugatti and probably has four others in his garage. And the workers are lucky if they could afford a scooter in many cases. I mean, how did this happen? It wasn't because we're bad people. I think we're very, very good people. I think we're very creative. We proved that. We proved it by, you know, again, the Internet, I don't know whether I mentioned, but 1964 is when it was developed. 
when did it really come into use? It, maybe 1990, we started using it and then it grew and grew and grew. But this was a 26 year or 20, at least a 20 year incubation period. Bell Labs could afford to do that. What, but, you know, again, I just have to finish the story about Bell Labs because it was the greatest research laboratory, I think, that has ever existed in this world. I mean, things from, it wasn't just the transistor and the internet, it was the laser. If you've heard of the Big Bang, which is our current theory of how the universe started, guess what? Two scientists at Bell Labs got the Nobel Prize for deciding, you know, discovery evidence that the Big Bang did indeed start the universe. You know, there are a number of so many inventions that came out of Bell Labs that are so critical for today, it, I can't enumerate them all, mainly because I can't remember them all as we're talking. But how did we go so wrong? I mean, Bell Labs eventually became a part of Lucent, which eventually went out of business and was bought by a European outfit. So Bell Labs now is situated a, a tenth of what it was in some Western country. What went wrong? My thinking is after the Second World War, the U.S. was on a gold standard. You had to basically stick to a discipline. Anybody that had U.S. dollars, and that was the unit of trade. We, we had the, you know, the, the reserve currency then, but it was backed up by gold. And so anybody at any time could take their dollars they had dollars and turn it into the U.S. and get gold in return. That's what the gold standard was. And gold was fixed at a particular price. I think it was $35. That worked great. And it kept discipline. We could not overspend. We could not, you know, spend on anything we wanted. We had to keep it within refined limits. We had to think long term because we had to be ready with the technologies to come, you know, 15 or 20 years later, like the Internet, 1964. I mean, we needed these technologies and it was sort of accepted that we would think long term. It wasn't going to be, a, you know, we couldn't think moment to moment. But in 1970, for a lot of reasons that may have preceded it, namely the Vietnam War, but nevertheless, it wasn't too late until Nixon officially took us off the gold standard in 1971. And that basically, I mean, there were a lot of other steps involved, namely, instead of the gold backing up our currency, it was oil, which was a totally different thing. And, you know, the petrodollar came into use and countries didn't need dollars because it was the only thing that was backed up by gold. They needed dollars then because dollars were the only things that the Saudis would accept in exchange for their oil. It was sort of a deal, a quid pro quo. We would protect the Saudis and they would price their oil in dollars. And we had the defense to do that. And the petrodollar was a totally different story because under the gold standard, you know, if we spent too much, people drew out the gold. And that's why Nixon took us off. We were running out of gold. We couldn't supply the world because we were spending so much money on the war and, you know, goods internally, the Great Society, whatever. And Nixon took us off the gold standard rather than trying to find the kind of discipline we should have found at that time. And that meant once we were on the oil, petrodollar standard, whatever else you want to call it, we could spend as much as we wanted on anything that we wanted. And there were no limitations. And it wasn't that we're bad people, but we're human beings. And it's like children in a candy store. You can spend without any consequences. And regardless of how high inflation went in this country, and it got in the 1970s, we had double digit inflation, I think 15% at one time, it still didn't make any difference. Everybody still needed the dollar because they could not get oil without the dollar. And as our inflation went up, oil prices tended to go. I mean, there were just a lot of factors. But the point is, and the bottom line is, there was no more discipline. And this allowed a financial industry to come into creation. It allowed our services to become incredibly bureaucratized. And it basically created so much that did not do this country very much good. And it also made money in the immediate future. The basic goal, quarterly reporting became 
everybody was hanging, you know, now, I mean, think of it over, you know, my lifetime, it's always been, how's the company going to do the next quarter? The only companies, incidentally, that kept thinking long-term that I can think of, and one I missed when I wrote a book in 1999, I, I actually didn't say nice things about them because it wasn't clear to me, but I did later on. But the one company for most of that part that was thinking long-term was Berkshire Hathaway. And we know the history of Berkshire Hathaway. They became one of the most successful companies on the face of the earth. And Buffett's philosophy has always been long-term. He always cares about the long-term. And he tells people, I don't care about this quarter, that quarter, I care about the long-term. And was best performing stock for so long. The other company, among all the technology companies that were born in the tech boom of you know, the, the 90s and 2000, only one company decided in its initial shareholder letter to make it clear that if you were an investor that just focused on short-term results, I don't want you as a shareholder. This company is not for you because we don't care about short-term results. We are building a company for the future. You know the name of that company? Amazon. And that kind of speaks for itself. You know, the wealthiest person in the world is today. It's Jeff Bezos. Even after giving a ton of his money to his wife, he's still the wealthiest guy in the world today. Yeah, it still pays off to think long-term, but we weren't doing it. As a country, we weren't doing it. We gave away Bell Labs. We sold our rare earths. We are completely dependent on others. And, you know, what's happened as a result of that, it, it's sort of like we're, we're in this kind of vicious circle in that the financial industry where just the example I gave you at the beginning and still today, if you go into Vanguard or any of these major financial shops and say, uh, here I am, a 40, 50 year old, 70 year old, whatever man or woman. How do I allocate my portfolio? Well, Vanguard happened to just recently run a four page advertorial, whatever you want to call it, in The New York Times. And they said, well, we tell people our discipline is still the same despite the pandemic. We haven't changed one thing. We still tell people it's a combination of stocks and bonds. Whoa. Even oil outperformed bonds in the first part of this century, the first generation. And oil had all those problems. And that's another issue with fracking. I mean, that was crazy, too. I mean, we did nothing that made any sense from a long term perspective. Nothing. I mean, very when I say nothing, I'm being too emphatic. But I mean, so little. And that happened because. We could do whatever we wanted. No one is going to, you know, look at what we're doing today. I mean, we're still spending money like, you know, drunken people on a bender. I mean, because we can and we can sanction people because, you know, the dollar has still that, that's the one legacy that we have left over of being the greatest economy, the greatest country ever, which, you know, was the case until at least 1970 and possibly 1980. I mean, it takes a while before you lose all these advantages. But I mean, you know, getting ourselves off the gold standard, focusing almost insanely on inflation, getting it down as low as you can go. The only people this helped were people in the stock market. They benefit from low inflation. I mean, that was a wonderful thing. The stock market has been the story. Basically, the financial industry has been the fastest growing industry in this country for the last, I don't know, 40 years, since 1970, probably, or since not, not 1970, certainly since 1980. They've been the fastest growing industry in this country. How much good do they do to this country when they give advice that is wrong, literally completely wrong. And for reasons that I argue in this book, it's going to remain wrong for the foreseeable future. Commodities, gold, I'm not saying it should be 100% of your portfolio, but it should have a major role. Something that's outperformed by 200 percentage points, better than the S&P, better than financial assets in general, doesn't deserve no position. It deserves a major position, especially given that the commodity scarcities that we saw develop in the first 20 years of this century are still continuing and going to continue. I mean, there's no reason to believe these are going to stop. 
Uh, to kind of be able to go over the second point of what's going to be responsible for gold's rise, you, you're talking about in the book, a new monetary reserve system. So what could the structure of that basket of currencies look like? And will it matter if it's digital or not? Well, I think it has to be digital for security purposes. I think that that's absolutely essential. And right now, as we speak, I'm really glad, Tom, you asked me that because I getting too carried away on the other. But China is testing and they're ready to institute a digital currency in their country. And they will be the first. And it's not like meant to be a competitor to Bitcoin or anything else. I mean, Bitcoin is not a sovereign currency and it will never be a currency for various reasons. But what China is doing, I mean, one thing realize about China is their currency is de facto, not officially, but de facto already backed up by gold. In other words, if you have a yuan, you can go to the Shanghai Gold Exchange and buy gold with your yuan. Most banks will give you gold for your yuan. And there are a lot of gold deposits in the banks in China, which help in lots of ways, which, you know, helps with their risk ratios. I won't go into that. I think a really great point you make in the book is that they have over 100,000 banks in China that you're able to exchange yuan for gold, right? Yes. I mean, they encourage it. And this was something that happened. There was a long time that China forbid their public from owning gold and they changed gears. They went from there, not by allowing their public to own gold, to commercials saying how good gold and silver were as investments. And that's what you should invest in. And people have put a lot of that gold into banks, you know, to be held for them. And, you know, that's one thing that gives Chinese banks a big advantage today, which you don't read about, incidentally, because gold can now be counted just as cash in measuring risk ratios, providing you have deposits to offset that gold that you're counting as assets. But that's, you know, just a technicality. But it's one reason China is not too worried about debt and all these other things that are going on. But I do believe, getting back to your question, that you must have, well, you know, basically, it's not that I believe. I'm quoting from, in the wake of 2008-9, the head of the Chinese Central Bank, who's one of the most successful officials ever there. I mean, he served in that position, I think, for 16 years. And I'm calling him the head because I cannot pronounce his name in Chinese. And I won't try. I'm not going to embarrass myself. But he, you can look <laughs> it up. He stepped down a couple of years ago, but he's still very, very active. He said in a 2009 white paper, and it was very short, it was about I don't know, four, five, six pages. I can't remember. And and not hard to read. He said that the ideal currency, he said that a reserve currency cannot be a currency of a sovereign country. And he was also speaking of China. He said, because, you know, you're conflicted. You don't know whether you should do what's right for your country or what's right for the world. He said, the only thing that really makes sense as a sovereign currency, and this was rejected at Bretton Woods, though Keynes and others, you know, really wanted it to be the case, is is a currency that is a basket of other currencies like the SDR. And he said that currency should be backed up by something else and, you know, a commodity or, or something else. And the point being, he didn't mention gold in particular, but it's the only possibility. Because again, what sense does it make to back up a reserve currency by copper if it's going to become scarce? I mean, you have to find something you can back it up with that everyone accepts. And gold's the only possibility. And, you know, since then, there have been people in China actually never written in English. Most of this stuff that you find about China backing their currency up with gold told to me inadvertently by Chinese people and was actually published in Chinese by the general secretary in charge of gold. He said, gold is part of the Chinese dream. It's going to back up our currency, but it's not their currency. They don't want that. They want a basket of currencies, digital basket of currencies that is backed up by gold. And this is where they're headed. You saw the first wake up call to me, and I really wasn't surprised by this at all, is when they started trading oil in one. And Basically, the trading of oil didn't mean a lot of oil exchanged hands, but what it did mean is that the price of oil was defined in terms of yuan. So when people signed contracts, if they wanted to still just deal in dollars, they had to convert the yuan into dollars because the oil, you know, was quoted in yuan. I mean, it was traded in China. So they set up a way of benchmarking oil in yuan and, you know, they've sort of gone from there. Now it's an open, no one knows. 
I would bet yes on this one, that the Saudis now are probably exchanging their oil for Juan. That would be my guess. That's a major thing because oil has been what really got us here, what really has let the dollar remain the world's reserve currency. It's been oil. And Russia and China, we know, are trading in other currencies. And now that they're testing the digital yuan, I think it's only a matter of time before Russia starts testing a digital ruble. And we are also testing, you know, our our central banks, the Western central banks are kind of waking up to this. And they're starting to get into testing, you know, digital stuff. The stage is being set, I believe, for a new currency. And it will be a currency like the SDR, which is currency. And gold is also defined as a currency. But this SDR, unlike, you know, the previous SDR, will have to be backed by gold to imply some discipline that you can't have countries just creating all sorts of money, et cetera, et cetera. And it will be different than the gold standard we had in the wake of Bretton Woods because the world is growing faster. And we will need a much higher price of gold in order to satisfy all the money that we have in this world. And I would guess, anyone's guess is as good as anyone else's, but I think if I had to guess, and the chances of this being right are probably close to zero, but I think that, you know, to get all the the steps involved, but what I think is most likely, (laughs) which is not saying a whole lot, is that eventually we have this basket of currencies backed by gold, and the question will always be what price gold will be. I would guess that you will have the members of this basket, and it may just apply to the East, to Asia and China, et cetera, but I hope hopefully the U.S. will be involved too. You will have leading officials, like the Fed meets, let's say, every six weeks now, and they decide the price of money with interest rates. We will have leading officials from every country in the world meeting maybe once every two months, once a month. There might be emergency meetings if if copper really starts running out, et cetera, to decide what the price of gold will be. So we have an adequate backing for this particular basket of currencies. But this is coming. And whatever the price of gold is, it's going to have to be many, many times what it is right now. I mean, you know, gold has been the best performing asset this century. I mean, I could say you've seen nothing yet. But one point I want to make, I could be wrong on this digital currency. I could be wrong on, you know, a basket of currencies being uh, backed up by gold. I could be dead wrong on that. That may not ever happen. I think it will. And I think you're seeing the steps being set right now in so many different ways. It's unbelievable that, you know, it's not making headlines. And I believe China believes this. And I, you know, can quote, you know, my book's full with quotes from the Chinese on this, things that were written in Chinese that, you know, I had to pay a lot to get translated. But even if I'm dead wrong, even if you think I'm the biggest idiot in the world, as far as this stuff goes, all you need do is look at the relative growth rates between these high income service oriented economies and the growth rates of the developing world. And you have to come to the conclusion that commodities are going to continue to play an ever growing, massively growing role in today's world, not in the US, but in today's world. And we don't have any, and we don't have even enough to keep our own economy going, you know, especially of these rare ones. So I think there's an interesting point there, Dr. Lee, that we can also add. And it's almost taking clues from China's behavior in buying gold. So it's kind of like watching an insider's trading report, trying to see what the smart money is doing since China has such a long-term view on getting things done. Do you have any idea how much gold they actually have? And also, could you highlight for us the fact that they have been mining their own gold reserves more than anybody else? Their mining of their own gold, China is not rich in gold. They're rich in a lot of other commodities like rare earths, but they're not rich at all in gold. Yet they've been the number one miner of gold for, I don't know, I think the last decade. They sometimes mine as much as 10% or more of their stated reserves. That is the most any country has ever mined of any commodity 
that we have record of. You can't find any commodity anywhere that any country has ever mined to the extent of 10% of their stated reserves. Now their reserves are finally, because it's, you know prices go up, your reserves can go up too because you, know, you have more money to dig deeper. But first of all, there's no way they were ever making any money doing this mining. I mean, maybe a mine here or there, but they have continued to mine to the point you know, where they probably cannot continue. I mean, you're gonna to have to see gold mining go down in China and China again, except and this is really important, except in their international, these so-called international zones, exports of gold are forbidden from China. Now, these international zones are where you see gold traded. There's an international gold exchange, et cetera. And so there's good reason. If the Saudis want to pay yuan for oil that they get from, let's say, the oil that's traded here, they're not going to buy a lot of oil. That would be done by contract. They can take the yuan and turn it around, come back to the international zone, buy gold and transport it out of the country. That's the only place where you can export gold. But China, you know, not only their mining, does it give something away? I mean, they're not stupid people. I mean, they don't mine at a loss. And, you know, <laughs> because they like losing money, they mine at a loss because they want to collect as much of this as they can. Now, there are people that are a lot more informed than I am in following these flows of gold, where they go, where, you know, through Switzerland, through this country, that country. But the people that have done the most thorough research on this come up with numbers like 20 to 30,000 tons of gold that China has accumulated. And you see gold vaults being built along the BRI. Belt and Road Initiative. I mean, these other countries are building these massive gold vaults. And, you know, that's for a reason. I mean, there's a lot of gold. If China doesn't have the 30,000 tons, certainly their neighbors plus China. I mean, Russia recently stopped buying because they were just in a terrible position. So they could not afford to because too many transactions are still taking place in dollars and Russia's economy was collapsing because of oil. But Basically, you know, China may have accumulated 30,000 or 20,000 tons. I mean, they are in the driver's seat in setting this new type of currency that would be, again, a basket backed by gold because we at most have 8,000 tons. Now, the people that are a little bit more conspiratorial than I am say that we don't have anywhere near 8,000 tons and maybe 2,000. I mean, the last time Fort Knox was audited, I don't know. 30, 40 years ago, and a lot of people say a lot of that gold's gone. I have no idea, but I'll accept the 8,000 ton figure for being what it is. And I think that China has at least 20,000 tons of gold. I mean, if you just count how much they've mined on their own and the import numbers that are reported on a regular basis, you know, the stuff that comes through Hong Kong, that is reported, that's public knowledge. You get big numbers, very big numbers, more than 8,000 for sure. And it's going to give them, I think, you know, an important leg up in doing this. We view China as such an aggressive power. China is not. I mean, China, you know, just to give you one example, China's whole military is built around self-protection. It's not built upon like North Korea has missiles that can reach the U.S. Maybe that's what they say. China, if they do, it's a very recent phenomena. They don't have a massive nuclear arsenal, though they could have certainly put a lot of money into that. No, I mean, they're basically a country that has hypersonic missiles, which I don't think we have, and they can defend themselves very, very well. That's why, you know, they're doing what they're doing in the South China Sea. I don't approve of all that. I mean, I really don't. But the only reason I'm bringing it up right now is that we really have very little to fear from China. I mean, I think China more than anything. And, you know, Ray Diallo, who's uh, mispronounced his name, I, I butcher. Dalio. Dalio. Okay. You know, he has made this point too. I mean, you know, similar kinds of points. I mean, we, we don't have anything really to fear from China other than cooperation. And I ask you, I mean, we were talking before air, if this country had not gone off the rails in the 1970s and 80s, where would our technologies be today? Can you imagine if we had continued to think 20 years forward, China today or this month or what, whenever, maybe, maybe they're having it now. They're having a mass meeting where they're setting out plans, not just for the next five years, but for the next 15 years 
and beyond. And, you know, this evidence is right in front of us. Really, really smart people like Jim Chanos, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, was saying China is just overbuilding. Look at all these crazy ghost cities that they have built. Remember the word ghost cities, the phrase ghost cities, all these ghost cities. They're just spending money for the sake of spending money. They're on the verge of financial collapse. Well, guess what happened to those ghost cities? They became very populated as urbanization increased dramatically. That's thinking ahead. I mean, is it easier to urbanize if you have a place for people to go? Or is it easier to urbanize if you want people to go somewhere and you have to build it? Well, I think you want to build it in advance of their going. In fact, one of those cities sits right in the center of their Belt and Road Initiative in China. It is a critical center. And it's this kind of thinking that I think we could really use. And I think by co and our scientists want to cooperate with China. Our scientists are completely politically blind. I mean, they do want to cooperate with China because so much more can get done for the sake of the world. We're now in a one world situation. And it's a world, not a country, that is going to survive or fail, in my opinion. And just common sense tells you, and China gets it, that if you're not going to cooperate, it's going to be much, much harder for that world to survive. I mean, we still have incredibly good institutions. We still have a lot of that great American spirit. I mean, there's still room for us to change and not have such abysmal education in, you know, the secondary grades. I mean, the students from Shanghai, Beijing, et cetera, are a couple of years ahead of our students, our 15 year olds. That shouldn't be the case. That just should not be the case. That's never been the case. We always had the best students until we were flooded with money and could spend all this money on this bureaucracy and education. I mean, it's just crazy what we've done with this money. More money per capita on healthcare by far than anyone else, yet life expectancy is dropping. Basically, it's a function of whoever has the most money in this country gets access to the best. That should not be the case. And it doesn't have to be. We can get back to where we were. I firmly believe that with all my heart, but we've got to wake up to what's happening. We've got to wake up to what we've done. And I think we can do it. But we're not doing it so far. I mean, I didn't want to write another book on China. I really didn't. I mean, I'm just one little guy sitting here and I think I see it because I'm sitting at home and, you know, I don't go out very much at me. And, you know, I didn't want to write this book, but this is meant as a real severe, severe wake up call. Maybe it's too late. I hope it's not. I just pray it's not. I don't think it is. I mean, I felt in 2011 it was getting too late. In the last two chapters of Red Alert, you know, I talked about that. That was really late in the day, and we've done nothing in the last 10 years to change this. This is the last chance. I mean, if there is a chance, and I think we've got to do it through cooperation, and we can be the generation, this not my generation, certainly not mine, the millennials, the Generation Z can be the generation that spurs a world on, that is willing to cooperate. And if we do, I think we'll find that China is very cooperative. But forgetting about all this, you know, musing that I'm doing, again, in terms of your own investments, if you don't believe me, if you think this guy is a wacko, convince yourself, just look at the growth rates in the high income countries over the period 1960 through 2000 and since then where they've declined and look at the growth rates of everyone else which were declining in those 40 years and now have accelerated. And then look up on the internet what is required for developing countries to become developed and you'll see that it is commodities. And then look at the USGS report on how many critical commodities we have in our country, virtually none, none, which means virtually no supply chains go through us and forget about everything else. You know, you don't have to believe me. You could think I'm a nut, but still convince yourself that it's true just for your own sake and for everyone else's. Absolutely. You make a lot of these points in the book and I was lucky enough for you to send me a copy before the interview. Thank you very much for that. There's so much great information in there and it is actually quite an impressive book I found. Just before we go, Dr. Lee, 
considering you know the two main reasons that you see for gold's rise you have a couple different targets in the book for what we could see from gold so do you have a little bit more of an idea of what you would want to say for your idea of where we could see gold in the next let's say 10 to 15 years well let's say 20 you know or maybe less maybe 10 to 15 okay well it depends how much of the world's currency is backed up by gold i think the $20,000 target that i have assumes that all of trade or, or, you know, one-way trade is going to be backed by gold, that this, you know, collection of currencies, let's say this SDR on steroids, that will be backed up by gold. And that would probably imply a price near 20,000. It could be a lot higher than that. If individual countries in their own domestic use of currencies also back up by gold, which I think is a very good idea because it imposes discipline, then the price target could end up being multiple. I mean, it could be end up being, I don't even want to say, because you'll think I'm a nut. So let me just say that 20,000 is a pretty well-measured target. It takes into consideration all the trade that's done. And that's what you really need a reserve currency for. You know, how do you denominate the trade? If you're buying, you know, from this country, what currency do you buy it in? Well, this is the currency you're going to buy it in this digital basket of currencies. To have enough gold to back up that currency, you would need a price of gold, I think, near $20,000 an ounce. And, you know, that's just based on, you know, the dollar value of trade, et cetera, et cetera, today. It's not a hard calculation is what I'm saying. It's a calculation that people can do. You know, you can just look at the total amount of trade, assume, you know, there might be some growth in it. And you end up easily with 20,000 if you start assuming that gold is used, again, internally for purposes like if we, we're on some sort of gold standard, we use the same currency as our U.S. currency instead of the dollar, then the price that you need to back up gold would be a lot higher. And I'm not going to even go there, but it could be a lot higher. But again, Tom, I want to come back to even if you think this is crackpot, what I'm saying about the digital currency, the rest isn't. It, it's commodities. And, you know, I don't have enough time to go into it now, but what we did with fracking is just so crazy. When in history has a country ever spent three quarters of a trillion dollars for an industry that in terms of cash is 300 billion? What is it 300? I get lost in these numbers. $300 billion in the hole on a cash basis. That was funded by our banks because we wanted to be energy independent. We're not energy independent now in any real sense. And that China has such a head start in all these alternative energies. We can catch up. And capitalism's doing a really, really good job in the solar area, et cetera. But, you know, we are so far behind China now. But anyway, more reasons to cooperate. They have a lot to share with us and we have a lot to share with them. The Chinese love working with us and we should love working with them. I mean, I'm not saying ditch all the controls. Yes. You know, figure out a way to do it. But, you know, one last anecdote, which I do remember from the 1950s, 1955, I think it was, Russia was our grand enemy, our Cold War enemy then. And I still remember, I was young then, believe it or not. I mean, <laughs> but I was not too young, unfortunately, to remember this. Russia launched the Sputnik, which was a little object that orbited the earth. And that showed that we had lost our edge, perhaps, I don't think we had, but we had lost our edge in the space race. That initiated a massive effort to get things going in the stems. I mean, we spent at that time billions, which were then tremendous amounts of money, bettering our education, doing everything we could to catch up with Russia. And we succeeded. I mean, in the early 70s, we landed a man on the moon. Russia was nowhere near there. I mean, I don't think they've still landed a man on the moon. We just did it today, confronted by a, a company called Huawei, which we still haven't really stopped. Instead of launching the kind of effort that we did in the wake of Sputnik, when we realized Huawei was making the best smartphone, they had a big edge in 5G, which they still do. What did we try and do? We tried to shoot it down. That would have been like in the 1950s when Russia launched Sputnik, instead of developing a program that took us to the moon, we shot down Sputnik and told them anytime you launch Sputnik, we're going to shoot it down. That's not the way to succeed. We're at a 
uh, exis- not, I don't want to say existential, but we're at the most critical Sputnik moment we've ever been. And let's stop shooting down Sputnik. Let's see if we can figure out a way of bettering it. And let's see if we can figure out a way of cooperating, yet having all those controls that we'll need in place. China's not an angel. We're not angels. No one's angels. They'll steal if they can steal. We'll steal if we can steal. So we have to correct and we have to make sure. I think we can do that. And I think we can find ways of cooperating. It's not going to be easy. But if we do, I think we'll have a grand world ahead of us. If we don't, you know, I'm saying this for my kids. I I really am. I didn't write a book like this because, you know, my age (laughs) took a lot out of me. But I'm saying it for you. I mean, you've got a whole life ahead of you. I'm saying it for my children who have whole lives ahead of them. I I really mean that with all my heart and sincerity. Read the book if you get a chance. But if you don't, then just go back to those commodities and the arguments I gave you. At least protect yourself. Yeah, I think that's a great place to wrap up. Like you say, you didn't write it trying to be negative or to be a doomsdayer, but a lot of the points that you bring up in the book, there's no way we're going to be worse off for you know buying gold and investing in our future as well. Right. Yes. And trying to view the world as a one world situation. I mean, how can you not? The high income country only account for 15 percent of the world's population. You want to how can you, you you know sooner or later you cannot ignore the other 85 percent. And we're at that point. And, you know, we've got to. I mean, for the sake of the world, this may be an existential point for the world. I mean, I don't think China will necessarily succeed unless we cooperate, although they may have a better chance than we do because, you know, they're a tighter knit society for whatever reason. Look at Taiwan, same people, you know, (laughs) the Chinese and the Taiwanese. The Taiwanese are Chinese that, you know, didn't stay on the mainland. And look at Singapore. I mean, You know, it's same people. There's a sort of civilization that defines China that's 5,000 years old. This was Jacques Marc's point, not mine. But it's one of the things that really started me thinking about this. But anyway, yes, I think that people should absolutely protect themselves, protect their families. I think gold should definitely be part of your portfolio. But I think much more than that, the West has to be willing to cooperate with China. But take all the controls you want. I think China will accept those controls. I really do, because it's in their interest at this point. They have what they need. They feel that they probably can go it alone. They'll accept the controls. Let's let's approach them. Let's find out ways of doing this. We're still that smart that we could share with them and still control. Yes, there'll be a rogue here, a rogue there. I mean, that's always going to be part of it. But we can, you know, root them out and in general prevent them from, you know, doing what we're so scared they'll do. And they can prevent us from, you know, doing whatever we want to do. I mean, they're not the only ones that hack. I mean, you know, we have a pretty good hacking system of our own. I mean, you know, Edward Snowden, I mean, you know, whatever. But we can prevent this from happening. I mean, again, protect yourself. And, you know, if you don't believe me, just believe me to the extent or convince yourself that you need to own gold. This is not a one off. Even Warren Buffett has bought gold. For all his life, he called gold a relic. Just, you know, why do you need this relic? Charlie Munger made, I think, a terrible comment. I mean, well, gold was okay if you were in a ghetto in Poland and you wanted to take money out, you put a gold bar in your pocket. Literally, he said something like, I mean, gold is basically, that's what the use for gold. No, no, it's not. It really isn't for all the reasons, you know, that I said in this book and for, you know, a lot that I've touched on. So please, for the sake of your own self and for the sake of your families, own some gold, please. Excellent, Dr. Lee. Just a reminder to our listeners, the book is going to be titled China's Rise and the New Age of Gold, How Investors Can Profit from a Changing World. And we can find more from you at Lieb PhD on Twitter and also StephenLieb.com. Okay, wait a couple of days before you go to stephenleave.com. That's a website in progress, but it'll be really, really good when I, you know, when it's, when it's, you can go there and look at it. Then, but yes, that would be a good place. Excellent. Dr. Lieb, thanks very much for your time today. You too, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website. (laughs) 
think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip-your-face-off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?